and welcome to On The Ledge podcast, the podcast where houseplants take over. Yeah, in this episode, they actually literally do take over. It's, it's the name of the exhibit. Welcome to the show. My name is Jane Perrone. I am podcast host extraordinaire. In this week's show, I visit the flagship garden of the Royal Horticultural Society, that's RHS Wisley in Surrey in England, and experience their houseplant takeover exhibit, which has a maritime theme. Cue a very bad sailor impression. Plus, I answer a question about a befuddled Phalaenopsis orchid, and we hear from listener Lynette. <laughs> Now, people, I don't know why you're doing this to a perimenopausal podcast host, but seriously, the people who have so far submitted their voice and text thoughts for the LGBTQ episode coming up on February the 27th. Whew, well, uh, it's been emotional already. Some wonderful, wonderful responses, but I need more. So if you haven't got around to doing this yet, get your brave pants on and give it a go. It's just amazing to hear your thoughts on the subject, what houseplants mean to me. So I'd love to hear from anyone in the LGBTQIA community with their thoughts. Just drop me a line at ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. And I fully expect it to be an emotional wreck for that episode because you've sent some lovely things so far. So thank you. And a heads up, no episode next week, February the 17th, 2023. Taking a week off, I may be celebrating a birthday. Legends of the Leaf, my forthcoming book in which I profile 25 iconic houseplants and tell you all about their backstories and subsequently how you should care for them. Well, it's just 10 episodes away from launch day, April the 27th. So, in every episode running up to that day, I'm going to give you one fact from Legends of the Leaf as a little bit of a teaser, a taster of what you'll find in the book. And the fact for this week concerns the lovely trailing succulent we know as String of Pearls, aka Curio Rolianus. Interesting, this plant, because a lot of the species featured in my book have been grown as a houseplant for decades and in some cases centuries. But this string of pearls is not one of those plants. You may be surprised that it only came into cultivation really in the 50s and 60s. And the name string of pearls, well, that was a later addition too. Curio Rolianus is named after the famous succulent expert Gordon Rowley, and he decided to give the variegated form of String of Pearls the name String of Pearls. So initially, String of Pearls, that only referred to the variegated form of Curio Rolianus. And he actually described this plant as resembling peas with mayonnaise, which I can actually really see. The variegated cultivar is particularly fascinating because you can look at those cream and green orbs. Each individual leaf is globular rather than flat, which is very good for water conservation. But if you look at that leaf, you will find that there's always a green stripe across it. And that is the leaf window. And in the book, I talk about the purpose of these leaf windows. We don't quite exactly understand how it works yet, but we've got an idea. All of that is in the book. But safe to say, the story of Curio Rolianus is not very well known, and I tell it in this chapter. Uh, but yes, String of Pearls actually started off as the variegated name and then came to refer to the plain green one too. Well, I hope that's whetted your appetite. If you've already pledged for the book, and I know many of you have, you can find out, obviously, more when your copy arrives. Hopefully, that will be a little bit prior to the publication date on April the 27th. And if you haven't pledged, you can pre-order a copy from your bookshop of choice or order direct through Unbound. And there's still time to get a signed copy or maybe a set of postcards of uh, all the illustrations from the book by the lovely Helen Entwistle. Do check the show notes for more info. One of 
the many bonuses of my job is I get to go and see amazing houseplant related things and take my recorder along to record them for your benefit. And that's what this week's interview is about. Just before the pandemic kicked off in 2020, I visited the first RHS Wisley houseplant takeover, the Monster Mansion Tour, as it was known. And you can find out about that exhibit in episode 128 of On The Ledge. I'll link that in the show notes. Three years on and the houseplant takeover is back. Let me set the scene for you before you hear the interview. The Wisley Glass House is a really tall, enormous space containing different zones for different kinds of plants, including tropical plants and cacti and succulents. And within that, a section has been carved out for the takeover using the existing beds and also adding in lots of features to make this space look like an underwater scene. How the heck have they done that, you may ask? Well, when you get down to it, it's surprising how many cacti and succulents actually look like things you might find in the deep. Anemones, jellyfish, seaweed and more. So the staff at Wisley have been incredibly clever at making this beautiful display. You get everything from a shipwreck covered in ripsalis with a scary looking eel emerging from the hull of the ship to the beach area where there are groins, those kind of dividers that you get on beaches covered in succulents, which really do look like the kind of seaweed displays that you get on beaches and includes some real showstopper plants. It's not all new plants that have been bought in. A lot of the plants are ones from Wisley's existing collection that have been shifted to take part in this display. I always say this, but this is particularly true for this episode. If you can, go and look at the show notes at janeperone.com, where there are lots of images of individual plants and the general displays at the deep sea dive display have a look at these while you're listening and it will greatly enhance your experience. And it builds quite well on my recent succulent episode with Andrea Galbreath because it really showcases the incredible things that you can do with succulents, the way they are so malleable to create all kinds of incredible sculptures. One of my favourites at the show were made out of upside down hanging baskets covered in smaller succulents like sedums and echeverias with Sansevierias hung upside down to look like jellyfish, with Tillandsias surrounding as well. It's a really clever idea and something that you could always build as a temporary display in the summertime to hang outside. Just so much fun. Uh, my favourite bit though, it has to be the Ripsalis covered shipwreck. Do check out the show notes for that. Oh, you know, I just love Ripsalis and I just thought it looked so realistic, this incredible display of these seaweed-like Ripsalis coming out of this hull of a boat. So if you do live anywhere in shooting distance of RHS Wisley in Surrey in the UK, then this deep sea themed houseplant takeover is on until the 12th of March 2023. You just pay to go into the garden and then admission to the exhibit is free. If you can, do get along. And if you can't, well, just sit back and listen to this and have a look at the images that accompany it in the show notes at janeperone.com. Uh, I'm Emma Allen. I'm one of the garden managers here at RHS Garden Wisley. Um, the glass house is one of my wonderful areas of responsibility. Um, we've currently got a fabulous temporary display for winter in here. Well, it's almost like we're by the seaside here because we've got lots of beach sounds in the background, which gives us a clue as to the theme of this display. <laughs> Can you tell so us this, more? This time we're doing houseplant takeover, deep sea dive, and uh, visitors can come in and explore an underwater kind of rocky canyon with lots of different plants, lost at sea, um, displayed all very creatively so uh, and and the wonderful thing is they 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 all look like either seaweed or coral or urchins or anemones um, or starfish uh, and and we realize actually that they're, they're the 
thing they all have in common is a lot of these plants that resemble underwater plants or animals are drought tolerant. Yeah, and so you're giving a great message about how to take care of your succulents at the same time as making them look like uh, a deep sea adventure, which is, which is marvellous. Uh, there's loads of cool things in this display. Can you just tell us about your favourite element of the houseplant takeover? Well, it's really hard to choose. Every area has got its own identity and we've separated plants out into their various uh, types. So we've got a bromeliad area, we've got a cacti area, an euphorbia area, aloes and agaves. Uh, but I think my favourite thing is the team have been super creative and they've made um, underwater sea creatures out of succulents using lots of echeveria and tillandsia. It's really hard to pick a favourite, but I think uh, the seahorse maybe and the anglerfish would be up there, but there's teeny tiny angelfish as well. So that, that's why I think across the board, the sea creatures are just adding a whole other layer of creativity to succulents and cacti. And it's showing how creative you can be because it's, the temptation is just to put them in a pot and put them on the windowsill and that's it. But actually... You can combine them in really quite interesting ways, even in the home. Obviously, we're in a giant glass house, so the world is your oyster, if I can make that pun. But at home, even, you can do interesting succulent arrangements, too. Yes, and we've actually got a video, which will be it's on our website now and I think our YouTube channel, which is how to make a succulent sphere. Um, one of our very talented team members here uh, puts a couple of hanging baskets together and then it shows you how to fill it so you can do, and do that at home. Um, and our jellyfish are, in fact, just half a hanging basket with the chicken wire underneath. So I, I think we, we may do more with, with that going forward and perhaps have a few more videos coming out with how, maybe how to make starfish, for example. Excellent. Well, that sounds like great fun. And I like the fact that you're separating out the euphorbias from the cacti. It's a bit of a pet hate, probably, of people who are into to houseplants. But, you know, everyone thinks that euphorbias are cacti. It's probably only a very small majority of us that get, that get wound up about this kind of stuff. But euphorbias are amazing. We're standing in front of this huge... I mean, it's a tree-like structure of euphorbia ringanes. Some of these cacti that we can have as tiny plants in pots do grow quite large, don't they? They do, um, and uh, as we were recently discussing, uh, I've got a pachypodium in a pot at home, and it's manageable at the moment, but you can see the ones here are um, probably about two metres tall, and they're quite spiny, so uh, they, they will get large eventually, um, but they'll get larger here in the glass house because we have such incredibly high light levels, uh, so they will be much slower to do that in your home. Absolutely, that is the key, isn't it? Good light really good light is best for these plants well let's have a wander around and have a look we're kind of i think we're probably on the edge we're moving towards the waterfall which is noisy but i think we still need to have a wander around and have a look at this amazing display i'm loving this crassula here that's a, a, a venerable specimen i guess that golem or one of those um oh yeah golem. yes it's golem yes look and at it's that got a 2002 date on but that doesn't necessarily mean that's when it started its life yeah. but, uh, that's just when we when we uh, brought it into the wisdom collection that's so amazing. it's at least 22 years old <laughs> and that's really showing Possibly you how 20, 21 how good care months. and light can give you an amazing plant because that's absolutely stunning and then we've got more sansevierias in here. Yeah. And again, you can see how they look a little bit like seaweed, particularly mm. um, these uh, very large leaf ones. We're, going, we're now going through the groins down into the water. <laughs> and these amazing displays that you've got here where you've got lots of strings of pearls. I see some lithops on the top of one of these uh, posts, echeverias. Uh, some ripsalis type uh, succulents this it really does look like seaweed it's really when you look at it from a distance you would actually be fooled by this it's very very clever um i believe this was a design that you had to put on ice because of covid that's right we were going to do this the year after giant house park takeover but obviously um not long after giant house park takeover covid hit the world and the, running the risk of creating and putting all this energy into an indoor display when quite often the glass house would be closed if the garden was open. 
because we're an indoor space. Um, so we, we, this has been three years uh, in the making. It's, it's wonderful to be able to do it finally. Well, it's, it's really fantastic to see it back. I was here for the last one and I love what you've done this time. It's so much fun. Teaching about succulents is important, I think, because they're so popular and that yet so many people get them a little bit wrong. What are you expecting people to kind of uh, be particularly captivated by and what tips would you give people for their cacti and succulents at home? I hope, um, A, that people are captivated by just the diversity. Um, there's so much diversity within the cacti and succulent group. Um, and they're really, you know, even just looking here at the agave, it's just within that genus, the diversity is phenomenal. Um, in terms of colour and the size of the leaves, the size of the plants, you know, they really are spectacular. Um, and then, you know, that you can you can have something that's really easy. The echeverias, for example, are really easy to grow and, and that's something everyone can have a go with. And they're also the really fun ones if you want to start making something. So things like echeveria and the Tillandsia azneoides, Spanish moss, is super useful for anything. And they'll just need a bit of misting over, really, uh, on, on the sculptures that the, the team have made. Yeah, this beautiful seahorse sculpture made of Tillandsia and echeveria is lovely. I mean, you obviously, it's quite big. It's about as tall as me, but probably you could create something a little bit smaller oh, that, at home. <laughs> absolutely. And you see, we've got little angel fish um, we've made. Um, uh, I think on the other side, there's a clam with a echeveria as the pearl inside. Uh, you could make a very small starfish. But you don't have to make an underwater-looking creature. You could make whatever you like. Um, the jellyfish are probably... Uh, particularly the smaller ones where we've used a smaller size hanging basket we found the smallest one we could get that would be much more doable at home and it'd be less weight to hang as well so I, I suggest those uh, to, to get you going absolutely but it's an amazingly sort of pliable material the succulent really for using uh, on for these kind of displays I'm loving this array of agaves you've got some real scarily spiny specimens here which are thankfully set back from the path um there i i love the agaves people uh, often struggle with them again because they get big but if you, if you can get them that big i've lost a few over the winter but uh, is there anything agave is perhaps not ideal necessarily for the windowsill um if echeveria is again absolutely lovely and easy to care for Anything else that you'd recommend from the display here for somebody who's looking for something to get started that may be a little bit more unusual, perhaps? Um, or I really love Euphorbia obesa. And again, they're small. They're never going to become an enormous plant. But it's almost like a little, slightly tartan-looking marking. <laughs> I think I've seen it called the tartan tennis and ball. It's, um, <laughs> there you go. And, and it's just such a fun little curiosity. So again very easy won't take up much space but an unusual plant to have in your in your collection let's keep um, let's keep moving forward a little bit we've got santimarias ahead of us too um i do love this display i this waterfall is gorgeous and i do love this display in front of it with the the whale tail and this sort of um beach side display of crassulas and palancos again so much fun it's great I think they, they aim to do a, a version of the wave, you know, the, right. the, the, the painting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love and the I way that... we did that even, last time in the house plant takeover. Even the, uh, the substrate is shaped into waves here by the Sansevieria area, which is really sweet. I <laughs> love it. Yeah, really and Dr. Agave, the botanist, is, has got a sort of um, a nice breastplate of Sansevieria leaves, which is fun. That's <laughs> right, and a bell. Oh with yes, the, with the sun severe leaves to, to create some of her adornments. <laughs> and uh, I mean, kind of correct, really. In that you know, in the past, sun severes were used for fibres. So um, let's there we go. That's actually not that far <laughs> from the truth. Uh, that's good to know. They're very yeah. tough, aren't they? They're very, tough very tough. tough. And again, there's just such diversity. You can get the cylindrical types that are very narrow and round. And then, you know, you get your more plastic sort of flattened, variegated shaped leaves. But then there's also these 
little ones here with the yellow centers. I think it's Canet Star Canary. Yeah, they're Star becoming Canary, so popular. Which is really, again, just such diversity within mm. just one genus. And I think we're just trying to show people they don't just have to have, you know, your classic looking Salsevieria. There's so much out there you can choose from. Yeah, I've got a bit of a thing. I know that the Laurentii, the sort of banana yellow margin one, is, is popular. But I do like the species as well, Trafasciata species, which is just this amazing green and silver shimmery look. Yeah. Um, yeah you're right. Even, even among the sort of what we might call very workaday plants there's something nice to enjoy so uh, yeah it's a, it's fantastic and let's just go around the other side of this amazing I love the anglerfish that's so clever with all the little bromeliads and then he's got his uh, his fishing rod and that's he's got a brilliant is that is that some what are the are they anthurium seed pods or something on there they use? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. They've used palm fronds for the um, for the fins and the tail, and I think a little bit of a uh, agave for the teeth. So My spiny clever. teeth. So clever. Well, I, I know you're hoping to attract lots of children to to visit the uh, exhibit. What do you think? children are going to make of this is it something that hopefully will spark off an interest in cacti and succulents i think that's where the sea creatures come in because i think seeing uh, plants used to create animals or uh, you know I, I think that's 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 what will um uh, capture the imagination it's like when we did giant house plant takeover we had cacti cupcakes and just put things in forms where you just wouldn't expect to see them so i think that's where Using plants to make animals, I, I think, will, will capture their imagination. And they'll also have to hunt. Each area's got a kind of feature plant, and we pop them in a terrarium, and they'll have a booklet to go around, and they have to help Dr. Agave, a botanist who's lost their plants at sea, and they, their children will have to then look for the plants and find them in the terrarium. And so for the agave section, we've got agave blue wave um, in there. Uh, we've got the echinocactus uh, grusonii, the barrel cactus, uh, representing the cacti section. So they'll have to learn and find a plant in each area. I'm loving as it. Well. Amazing, amazing stuff. Well, it's a real beautiful display. And um, obviously, as always, for, for the listeners who won't be able to make it, I'll um, put some um, pictures in the show notes so they can follow along. But it, it's gorgeous, and thanks so much for sharing it with me. Uh, absolute yeah. pleasure. Thanks very much, Jane. Thanks for your lovely feedback on recent episodes. I'm still getting suggestions on the pot hacks episode. I particularly liked Julia's contribution. Julia sent me a picture packed email of many of her plants thriving using plastic bottles for moss poles and also as planters getting really really crafty which I love because a lot of people spend a lot of money buying virgin plastic moss poles why we can just recycle things Julia I particularly like the one full of begonias but yeah that's probably not a surprise to anyone who's been listening to the show for a while another top tip from Julia in her email was about how to make sure that you can separate decorative pots from the inner pot. And she said that somebody on YouTube called Minimalist Callie, who I hadn't come across before, but I've now subscribed, suggests using medical tape folded over on itself, but the tail end free to stick to the pot. So there's a little handle to grab onto. This kind of tape is usually waterproof, so it works well as long as you have enough room to hide your little tape handles between the inner and outer pots. So I'll put a link to that video in the show notes if you want to go and check it out from Minimalist Cali. Very, very handy. I'm loving that tip. I mean, usually I'm the person who's just getting compost all over the floor trying to separate the two. So now I just need to find some medical tape. I need to raid my first aid box. And now it's time to hear from listener Lynette. My name is Lynette and I live in the southern United States in Tennessee zone 7A. I've lived here all my life. When did you get into houseplants and why? I've always loved houseplants. 
I grew up in the 70s and have such good memories of my mom making macrame hanging baskets for her Hartley philodendrons. There were always cuttings propagating in a pretty vase on a window ledge. And she always knew just when to put the Christmas cactus in a cooler room to force it to bloom for the holidays. When did you get into houseplants and why? I have several plants, both houseplants and garden flowers, that I've kept through the years that were my mom's, and one I'm especially proud of that was my great-grandmother's that dates back to at least the 1920s. Both of my grown daughters have a propagation from it, and honestly, I always have two spare propagations just in case something happens to the mother plant. What's the latest addition to your houseplant collection? I can't resist an aeroid, especially philodendrons. Most recently, I added two philodendrons, a plowmanii and a melanochromisum. No, melanochrysum. Please forgive my terrible pronunciation. Complete the sentence, I love my houseplants because... I love houseplants because they bring nature's indoors. I've always been connected to nature and being able to have a natural element in my home centers me. It's honestly my main form of self-care. I've generally been able to keep houseplants to what a normal person might call reasonable, but two things happened all at once. First, with the pandemic, I started working at home and my position converted permanently to working from home. So I always try to surround myself with nature and calm that's never been more important to me. Second, as empty nesters, we bought a smaller home. Why would a smaller home mean more houseplants? It's a great question and my husband is still trying to figure it out. Our new home is wrapped in windows that are east and south facing. The bright indirect light floods the house from morning to night and it is honestly a houseplant paradise. Who is your houseplant hero? Aside from Jane, proud superfan here, my go-to resource is Summer Rain Oaks and her YouTube channel, Plant One On Me. She's so in touch with nature and she brings it into her home in the perfect, lovely way. Her channel's the first place I go when I purchase a new plant to see what her advice is. Name your plantagonist, the plant you simply cannot get along with. Okay, honestly, I can't keep a spider plant alive. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I've killed three in two years. I'm sure it's our county water that's filled with minerals, but I already buy distilled water for my pitcher plants and I'm sure not buying water or collecting rainwater for a spider plant. For that, it's survival of the fittest. Thank you so much, Lynette. Reminds me of my time living in the southern US to hear your glorious accent. And if you'd like to take part in Meet the Listener, drop a line to my assistant Kelly at ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and she'll send you the very simple instructions for taking part. And now it's time for question of the week, which comes this week from Heidi and concerns a Phalaenopsis orchid, the moth orchid. Probably, well, no, definitely the world's most popular and ubiquitous of the orchid family, in terms of houseplants anyway. I don't actually know which is the most common orchid in the wild. I should try and find that out. Anyway, this is a tale of two spikes. Spike A came about late last summer and then stopped growing. Spike B started growing in October and has been thriving. So as I understand it, Heidi, Spike B, although it appeared after Spike A, has run away with growth and decided to bloom much more quickly than the one that came before it. You've helpfully sent lots of lovely pictures of your moth orchid, which does look nice and healthy. It's got a good set of roots on it. I can see that the roots are lovely and green and in no way rotted or distressed or shriveled. So that is a great start when it comes to moth orchids. And looking at these two flower stems, I can see exactly what you mean. Why? The heck has one of them just decided to stop growing and Heidi's thinking that maybe snipping it back might be the answer, cutting it back to one of those nodes, those little scaly bits on the flower stem might jolt it into growing a bit faster. But Heidi's not overly concerned. This orchid has been in Heidi's possession for about four years and it's the first time it's re-bloomed, which is thrilling. 
So Heidi points out, I don't need that spike to bloom, but it would be fun. Looking at your plant, Heidi, first of all, well done. Nice to get a rebloom. It looks like it's got loads of growth on it, actually. The flower spike that is budding up and is about to flower, not only have you got flowers, but you've also got side stems coming off that, which are going to produce flower as well. So it's going to be a productive one. What do you do with that other one? My approach with this kind of thing would be just leave it alone and see what happens. There could be all kinds of reasons why that particular spike didn't quite go as fast as the other one. It could be to do with light, the root system around that particular stem, the availability of nutrients, all may be factors. Hard to know, really. We'll probably never know with this kind of thing whether the, that's <laughs> what's go exactly what's going on. But I suspect that eventually that flower spike will start to grow again. It may be that you move the plant and it just meant that one side was getting better conditions than the other side. And so the one on the slightly less favourable side just decided to put all of its, just was stalled and the plant decided to put all its energy into the other spike. I think it'll come good though. And it's exciting that you've had two flower spikes Phalaenopsis orchids that you buy from, you know, general stores and garden centres are massively hybridised. Their genetic history is intensely complicated and they've been bred to be floriferous, to flower a lot. So it's not surprising that oftentimes orchids will develop more than one flower spike. You only ever get one flower spike at a single point on a stem. So a single point on a stem will not develop two separate spikes. And you'll if you look at the position of those spikes, they tend to be about two leaves below the top. So look at your budding plant and you'll count down two leaves. And that's probably where these flower spikes are coming from. One on each side of that stem, as is the case with Heidi's orchid. And if you provide it with enough resources in the form of good light, nutrition, water, temperature, etc., then your plant is more likely to produce those two flower spikes rather than just the one. I think that Heidi's plant has paused one of them because maybe conditions aren't quite as good. That move may have changed things a little bit. And the orchid saying, hang on, because of course, flowering takes up an enormous amount of energy for the plant. It's vital for the plant to flower because it needs to reproduce. But at the same time, it doesn't want to put a load of energy into flowering when conditions might not be exactly right. I think that if Heidi continues to care for this plant really well, it will flower. So yeah, I would just hold on, uh, Heidi. And once those flowers have finished, there's a big debate in the orchid world about whether you should cut the flower stem right back to the base once the flowers are finished or whether you should cut them back to a node. I tend to cut them back right to the base because then the plant can kind of reset itself and grow and develop more, ready to go again. The plant will have to then put on some more leaves in order for the next set of spikes to come along. One of the things that can affect orchid flowering is temperature and traditionally a drop in temperature, particularly a nighttime drop in temperature, has been important for initiating flowering. However, as I was saying about breeding, lots of hybridization means that the strength of that need for a drop in temperature has reduced in some orchids. So some orchids might flower perfectly well at a very, very steady and continuous temperature without that drop in temperature in the autumn and winter to initiate flowering. So yeah, sorry to be a little bit vague, but it's one of those things where the orchid world is complicated. Everyone has their own view about how to do these things. But I would say in your case, Heidi, leave it alone, see what happens. And I think that probably your second spike will come good in the end. I do hope that helps. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, do drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. That is all for this week's show. 
Reminder, no episode next week. What will you do with yourselves? Well, do check out the back catalogue. There's more than 200 episodes to go back and listen to, or indeed listen again. And also on that page, which I'll link to in the show notes, there is a list of other podcast interviews I've done for other shows, so you can still hear my dulcet tones. Anyway, have a fantastic week with you and your plants. Take care of yourselves and love to you all. Bye. music you heard in this podcast was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Komiku, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. <laughs>